Um, hi, everyone. Um, before I start, I wanted to ask a question to you all guys in the audience. Um, how many of you have uh, used PayPal to pay for things on websites in recent times? Yeah. Wow. In recent times, I mean a back a few months. All right. Um, my name is Vishaka, and I will be talking about how uh, we build faster checkout experience at PayPal using GraphQL. Well, wow, that's a lot of uh, buttons on the screen. Some of them, looks, uh, they look fairly 90s. And I cringe at them every time I look at them. This is the state we are coming from. This is a few years back. Some of them were created by us. Some of them were created by uh, merchants hoping to customize their checkout experience. And some of them should have never seen the light of the day. <laughs> and this is where we are at now. So we re-architected our entire PayPal uh, checkout integrations um, three years back. And um, what we basically did was open sourced the frameworks or the libraries which powers this. Um, we created truly cross-component, uh, cross-domain components and open sourced them. So what's basically happening now is that we create all, our, all of our payment buttons inside an iframe. So if you want to check those out, you can check that on, on GitHub on these two uh, different repos. So I'm not going to be talking about constant branding, brand visioning, and all of that here, because that's pretty obvious, right? Like if you get to create your own payment buttons on the merchant's website, that gets you all of that. But the, one of the major advantages of doing this was that it got us pixel perfection. So no matter, how, no matter how, what devices you are on, you're going to see those crisp images every time. And also, we created several other um, flavors of these PayPal buttons. So the merchants could pick and choose uh, whichever they wanted and have a consistent checkout experience. And obviously, all of this, since they were inside an iframe, were sandboxed from the rest of the merchant side. So we no more had to worry about all those style sheets breaking us or we breaking them in that matter. Uh, also, a few years back, we tried to create this another, uh, we write a lot of JS code every now and then. So we created this another uh, library called ButtonJS, which created buttons directly on the merchant side. And that was a nightmare, because we were bre breaking them, and they were breaking us all the time. So what do we do? We create um, JavaScript payments SDKs for the merchants to drop on their websites. These payments SDKs uh, Webpack bundles all the code which is required to create buttons and uh, to re required for the checkout experience. Webpack bundles all of this and ships it back to the user. So once a merchant integrates with us, they get this PayPal button, you click on it, go through the login flow, pay for your stuff, and come back to the merchant side. These are, the, these are the few lines of code you need to actually integrate with us. If you look at the top of the snippet on the first script tag, you would see uh, this URL, which gets you all of this code. So we are shipping massive amounts of codes in less than 200 milliseconds. And we get close to 100 million requests per day. Now, I know that is a lot of, lot of tight bundling in a very short period of time. I, I promised GraphQL to you guys, and this is uh, where we get started with it. So how are we achieving that 200 milliseconds of response time? Obviously, through GraphQL. Um, before we deep, that's a lot. Before we uh, deep down for, we uh, dive further into the schema design for all of that, I would want to give you a little bit of history here. We had a REST API. I like how I'm saying had a REST API. Anyway, we had a REST API for um, determining the eligible payment methods. Now, this is required since we want to know what all do we actually want to render back on the merchant's website. So it, it was doing its job. Some of the code uh, was scattered on the client side. Some of the, some of the code, which was still on REST, was all con uh, controlled by config. It required push changes, restart of the apps, and all sorts of things. As our collaborations with different payment methods across the globe were increasing, it was a perfect excuse, perfect um, 
excuse to actually migrate towards GraphQL. Um, if you look at this schema, uh, you would see the funding eligibility on the right side on the snippet, you would see the funding eligibility field declared at the root level. Now this accepts a bunch of inputs. Um, these inputs are a combination of merchant's information and the user's information. We get all the merchant information from the integration script. Remember we saw, saw that in a few slides before. And we get all the user information from whatever we can collect from the user's browser, including the buyer country, locale, IP address, cookies, etc. So the first level has funding eligibility in the schema definition. The second one, the second is uh, are all these payment methods. So it's an exhaustive list. We have we currently have it at least 20 different payment methods we offer today across the globe, wherever you are from. And um, the third level has um, uh, all these descriptor fields for, for these payment methods. First one being eligible, which actually tells you whether this particular payment method was eligible or not, the reasons behind it. So we not only send reasons for why a particular uh, payment method was not eligible, but also because why it was eligible. I would be talking about this uh, particular field in, our, uh, in the following slides on how it helps us in analytics. We also have this field called recommended, which tells you about whether uh, why a particular payment method is recommended over others. And certain, it also carries certain contextual information for that payment method. Um, so uh, we have resolver functions for all of these different payment methods. A resolver is a function, um, for some of you guys who, who may not know, uh, a resolver is a function that fetches data for the field. So every field you are seeing in this query is backed up by a resolver function and can get information from any resource you want to. So we implemented a resolver functions for each of these payment methods, which were executed parallel. We all know that a query in, in GraphQL is executed in a top-down, um, breadth-first fashion. This very um, out-of-the-box fu functionality is what we leverage. So since these resolver functions were being executed in parallel, all the respective downstream API services were executed in parallel as well. So the entire response time the GraphQL query API was going to take was approximately going to be um, the latency of that partic of one of the payment methods, which took the maximum amount of time to get a response back. That was definitely a huge um, performance increase from when we had REST APIs. And also, of course, uh, different clients can choose to um, request for different payment methods, not necessarily all. So in this case, the clients were in real control of the data they had to choose. In our case, we could pick and choose whatever payment methods we wanted for that particular application and re leave out the rest. Um, the next uh, uh, implementation we did was that all of our resolver functions for the payment methods were had separate implementation details. Now that meant that they were isolated to each other. That paid way for a lot of different teams to inner source and collaborate with each other. A real-time example would be that recently we had a team from Singapore who wanted to add their own payment method in the schema definition and do their own implementation. They could do it in seamlessly without we breaking them or they breaking us. We have also employed a lot of different um, caching for similar APIs across resolver functions, which I would be talking about in the next slides. So um, in summary, with all the sandboxing we do by putting buttons uh, in an iframe and by, call, by having a GraphQL server for um, determining the eligible payment methods, we, we open doors for different various other payment methods across the globe as such that the merchants do not need to reintegrate with us. Also, the entire schema definition the in design is pretty scalable. So if you want to add more payment methods, we can anytime without slowing anybody else. Also, we, through this, we are able to provide meaningful and impactful checkout, re, uh, checkout experiences through regional payment methods. These are a few examples of our payment stacks in Netherlands or in Germany. 
So for each of these, uh, the merchants did not have to reintegrate with us. And if tomorrow we want to add a few more payment buttons here, we can do it seamlessly. Optimizations. Let's also talk about a few more optimizations we did at our GraphQL server. Two basic things most of you would have heard about, memoization and caching. Um, memoization is just another type of caching one can do um, to cache their stuff in the context of that function. And the function here was the actual request lifecycle. So here you are, you're actually seeing the pretty much the code we use to memoize our stuff um, at our servers for, for this particular instance. Um, so we, what we do is validate, uh, we validate or check a bunch of inputs, make sure they're all right, and create a cache based off the function name. So the function here is going to be the downstream API service. Um, and, the, uh, and we create that cache key using the function name and the bunch of inputs here. This cache key, we attach it to the rec object. This is a node server, so we attach it to the rec object. And this information for that particular downstream API service hangs off in the entire request lifecycle. So uh, what that typically means is that for a particular call to our servers, let's say we have five different resolver functions, and five of them, out of those five, two of them have similar APIs combination of similar APIs they might be calling. In that case, we can use this particular code to make sure we're not calling that API more than once. The next off is um, caching. Uh, after our first uh, release, uh, of all of, after our first release, we recognized a few specific APIs who we knew their responses are gonna generally persist for a few hours and for some for even a few days. So um, at PayPal, we have Redis, Mencash, storage-like structures. It's called Mayfly. So what we did was for um, certain APIs, we started persisting all of that information in the cache. Um, we can visualize it this way. So for a, let's say there's a, there's a website, and that website gets a request. And we, we know that this, this web, website is backed up by a merchant, a constant merchant. That's not going to change. Their account information is not going to change. So we create a cache of that particular merchant's account information so that, and, uh, and so that any subsequent request which this website gets, we uh, get all of that information off of that cache. This, again, saved us a lot of milliseconds because sometimes the lookup for these uh, merchants, the information, is quite high. Next up, power, powerful insights via instrumentation. Why would you want to instrument your API? Because you want to know if it's lacking somewhere, how it's performing, and things like that. In REST APIs, um, you can only do so much. You can know how many times a particular API was called in, but you would never know um, the number of times or how a particular field of a particular resource is being utilized. We can do all of that um, through um, Apollo servers. Uh, if, you, if you run an Apollo server, you can enable this uh, flag, tracing flag, which gives you detailed granular information on all the different resolver functions, um, how they're doing, how much time did it take to resolve each of them per field, and how many of them get executed for a period of time. So we use that flag to pipe all of that information on tools like Grafana. And the, the, this is a real, two, real time two snippets from the tool. Where the first one you, is, which you see is the resolver duration. And uh, I don't know if you can see, but the line, each of the information on that table says funding eligibility underscore, the payment method, and their different fields. And the next one you see is a resolver count, the number of um, resolvers which are being executed on an average. So this gives us an, a very uh, powerful insight on how our resolvers are doing and which particular resolver is slowing us down. This helps us catch all those bad downstream API services and rectify them, if possible. Remember, we were talking about the reasons field as well in our schema definition. So that reasons field returns us uh, um, an array of strings. Those strings are the actual reasons why a particular payment method was eligible or not. 
at one particular time we are running a lot of different experiments for a payment method we call a lot of different apis for the same payment method so our data analytics team can pipe that information and see how we are performing how our ex ab tests are performing and things like that and we do not uh, we have specific hooks for that and we do not uh, flush that information back to the uh, back to the client so it's a internal field through our experience uh, throughout releasing different phase uh, different phases in the graphql server we, uh, we had we identified four major benefits out of it one was obviously the performance um, the graphql this, this graphql decisioning layer is on hot hot render path of uh, rendering our entire checkout experience and we we were able to achieve that under 200 milliseconds so uh, several benefits out of the box uh, from using graphql on your servers helped us monumentally in increasing our performance and speed next was dev experience um, Danielle uh, talked about dev experience in GraphQL yesterday, and I would totally want to corroborate on that. Picking up, understanding GraphQL is super easy, and uh, because of this, a lot of uh, my team, our, our sister teams, all of them were able to understand it pr pretty quickly and contribute and migrate a lot of our APIs on the GraphQL. So the adoption was fairly smooth. The next benefit was flexibility. The client applications, whichever were uh, consuming this particular GraphQL decisioning layer, they had the flexibility to choose what they want and leave out the rest. So this was pretty. This was an easy win for us because um, this way we this way it was directly controlling the size and the shape of the data we were shipping back to the um, uh, user's browser. So this was a, 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 an out of the box uh, feature, which was definitely a win-win for us. And the fourth most important benefit was evolution. Evolution of your API, how you could do it so confidently. So uh, you, didn't have, you didn't have to, we didn't have to worry about creating major versions anymore, bumping it to major versions, or the need to keep maintaining our previous versions. We could make incremental changes on the APIs and then adapt that. In, in companies with complex processes such as ours, um, we have seen that the teams are much likely to adapt uh, to small bits of changes, those incremental changes, than really big changes. And that is one of the adoption migration strategies we employed even for these releases. We coded whatever we had to on the GraphQL servers and then started migrating bit populations bit by bit. So we had a small population which was calling the GraphQL server and the rest of the population was still falling back on, our, on the REST APIs. And once we realized that our APIs are doing well, the GraphQL is doing well, it's pretty stable through all the powerful insights, uh, we were able to migrate all of that completely. Also, uh, since you have granular information on all these different fields, how it's being used, you know what fields are being used and what is not. So you can very confidently deprecate a particular field using the deprecated, um, excuse me, deprecated directive and uh, let the clients know uh, that, uh, that the particular field is deprecated. So. Uh, these are the experiences we've had uh, by implementing and move, migrating our entire decisioning layer at a GraphQL server. Um, this is a very small picture of what we are doing uh, at PayPal with respect to GraphQL. If you want to come work with GraphQL, React, Gatsby, or other fun, fun tech, please come and chat with me. And uh, you can also um, check out this um, URL to know about, to know more about what fun stuff you're doing at PayPal. PayPal is hiring. And um, I would also like to give a big shout out to Daniel and Mark, who've been uh, providing me with their invaluable insights. They work with me and uh, have been providing their uh, constant mentorship uh, on whatever I'm doing at PayPal today. Thank you. <laughs>